that music. <laughs> For a minute at a time With John and Will And I guess you just rhyme It's Bad Minute Attention citizens of Fair Gotham And welcome once again to Bat Minute Forever The show that is the number one cure for a bad case of gas I am one of your hosts, John Parker and I am firing into the sky like a Texas oil baron. It is I, Niall McGowan. <laughs> that that is perfect that you brought that up because I've I've got a lot to say about that that gunfire. Uh, but we are joined by two very very special guests. It's a new team up. We haven't had this this duo together before. We have the wonderful combination of Jaff and Alex Thompson. Hey, thanks for having us. Welcome to your new world's finest. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I'm I am uh audio man. Audio man <laughs> man man man. man. It's like, I love it. I love bringing people together. <laughs> That's the thing as much crap as I gave that Jesse Eisenberg Lex Luthor like back in the day when that movie came out. I have been quoting him constantly. Like I say that little like I love bringing people together like the people every odd week now. And I'm constantly doing that whole like oh boy, are we having problems up here? Like <laughs> is it is it weird that now we have a different appreciation for a movie, even if it's bad, if it gives us memes, it, there's a certain love we have for it. Yeah. There's yeah. a real thing. It's like, oh, look, Revenge of the Sith is a stone cold classic now. It's like, oh, look at all the memes that came out of that. I feel like the Star Wars prequels are loved a little more now because now we can share prequel memes with each other more easily. Yeah, yeah, totally. It's true. It's brought more joy to me because when they first came out, I was convincing myself, oh, they're good. They're fine. They're, they're great. And then as time went on, I realized, no, they're awful. Mm. Uh, yeah. And now I kind of like them again <laughs> because of the meme. Yeah. So long and thanks for all the memes. <laughs> now the worst thing a movie can do is be completely forgettable and boring. The Justice League movie. I couldn't tell you one thing that happened in it. I can't quote a single line from it. Other, than, in... other than Superman's fake uh, upper lip. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's interesting you use that as the example as well because I just watched it finally after all this time. Um, about two months ago. Oh, for the first time? I, for the first time. I didn't watch it before that because I heard such bad things. I was like, nope, 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 nope. So I watched it, and I remember saying to Niall afterwards, oh, that was pretty good. I didn't mind that. That was all right. But I, at this moment, cannot remember any of it. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the race between The Flash and Superman over the end credits because that was like, oh, that's a cute little nod to have there. Yeah. That they finally did that little... Doesn't remember... sound familiar. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember the whole, like, the really awful bit where, like, you could just tell it was Josh Whedon, where, like, mm. Superman says to Batman, like, oh, it's not because you like me, right? And then Batman says, like, it's, I, I don't not. And it's like, what the hell is that? Like, what, <laughs> what, what is this? Why are you giving that dialogue to Batman? What the hell are you doing? But yeah, if, the, if the Flash said that, you'd be like, oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> but, you know, the thing is, though, yeah, I can't remember anything of that, but, like, as soon as I walked out of Batman versus Superman, I was doing the, and the bell cannot be wrong, wrong. Ding, 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 And I was giving Jesse Eisenberg crap for that role for years, and now it's like, you know, <laughs> I actually have got a lot of time. Even though it's a, a terrible version of Lex Luthor, it's a very yeah. quotable version of Lex Luthor. Though, well, so. That's the thing, right? It might not be a good Lex Luthor, but he's, he's a great villain in, yeah. with what he's doing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if it was not called Lex Luthor, you'd be like, oh, okay, he's he's cool. This is good. Yeah. Kind of like the face in this movie. Speaking of, yeah, I was about yeah. to say, speaking of someone who's doing a great villain, if not a great version of whatever villain they're supposed to be doing. Yes. <laughs> now, that's the thing. Professional nothing, segue. <laughs> nothing like Two-Face. Nice. Um, nothing at all like Two-Face. But what do you both think of his performance? Because we've, we've kind of been enjoying it because it's so campy. Mm-hmm. I'm someone who, I, I do agree, it's not a good two-face. I'm someone who always enjoys seeing really good actors uh, just chewing the hell out of the scenery in a bad movie. <laughs> yes. You know, Raul Julia and Street Fighter being obviously oh. like the Ur, the Ur example, but mm. 
Mm. You know, I love this like classically trained, you know, very respectable actor just in every scene. Aha! <laughs> Sometimes for like five minutes at a time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, I appreciate again. Yeah, it's not a good Two Face, but I, I appreciate it as a thing. Mm. I will say though, this minute, um, for several reasons we'll get into. I think this may be the lowest ebb of Batman Forever for me personally, with Batman mm-hmm. as a character. And it also has the worst line of dialogue potentially in any Batman movie, if not any movie ever. <laughs> so. Oh my God, I'm looking forward to that. I, I should introduce the minute. This is minute 79. Uh, the minute starts with Batman scaling and it ends with Batman burning mm. or about to anyway that's that real like you know if that if that cape wasn't there there would be a prime shot of badass right at, at that point it's just <laughs> like just joel schumacher cursing like why why must he wear a cape i must find a workaround somehow eventually and he's like wait a minute a montage might be the idea <laughs> well uh, so yeah we are back as batman he scales a wall in his pursuit of uh, two-face and his gang but they are fleeing the scene well, I say fleeing. I mean, they're they're fleeing in victory, if that makes any sense. And they're wildly firing shots into the air, which is very cowboy. And it's basically how we in England picture all Americans at all times. <laughs> so. it, it, it's accurate. Yeah. If you've seen Yosemite Sam, that that's <laughs> America. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> Be America. warned, America, when quarantine ends, everyone's going to leave their house and unload their Glocks into the air. So you may want to stay inside for another day or two so you don't get hit by the bullets on the way back down. That's always um, what I've thought. Like, surely those bullets, they got to come down somewhere. They do. They do. <laughs> um, I remember that being uh, the premise of what happened in one episode of CSI. Oh. Um, oh, wait, imagine that. Though, as, as fascinating as that is, that's also a really anticlimactic kind of solution to the crime. Oh, it was just someone fired yeah. into the air. Well, I mean, CSI, a lot of their episodes, especially earlier, they were they were basically splitting the team up and doing like three cases at once. So uh, it was, you know, the C-plot was yeah. this woman who was just suddenly dead in her backyard from a bullet wound, and the bullet's at this really weird angle that doesn't make a lot of sense, and it turns out some idiot was in his backyard, <laughs> you know, three blocks over, and shot a gun right up in the air. Mm. Oh, my God. But you That's see a... Two-Face, he don't care. Yeah. No, 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 no. That's always what imagine, though, would have been in, like, the, you know, of course, the, the, one of the most famous moments of Point Break is Keanu firing into the air in frustration because he can't bring himself to shoot Bodhi. And, like, you know, how long is Keanu, like, lying there after that? Because it could be like, oh, crap, and just seeing, like, a hail of bullets just coming right back down on top of him. I think if you, sh- if you shoot straight in the air, I think actually the safest place to be is right underneath where you shot because wind is going to take him. A little. Yeah, that's oh, true. I'd love yeah. it then if the bullets accidentally did hit Bodhi. He's like, oh, no! <laughs> <laughs> it just turns into like, like a mini tornado pursuing him down the street or something. It turns out secretly he's uh he's dead shot all along. Oh <laughs> Deadshot bulls- Origins. Well, well I, I was thinking dead shot I was thinking of the Colin Farrell character in my head, but then I was like, oh crap, what's his name? Oh wait, that's right. DC has a character with the exact same ability. Deadshot, mm. fine, we're good. Yeah. I love the way they do that in comic books. They just both yeah. of these big companies just constantly rip each other off. Yeah, oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> Shamelessly. So, that's what's even kind of currently happening now. Because like, it's one of those things. Like, I don't want to poo-poo the movie because I know like a lot of people get sort of antsy about it. But like, if you watch Birds of Prey, that is clearly just DC having watched Deadpool and been like, oh, we could do that. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Do we have a Deadpool like character? Oh, we could do that with Har- like Harley Quinn's kind of like Deadpool in the comics. We can just make our version of Deadpool, and we'll yeah. do all the same tricks. We'll have like, oh, I'm telling this story out of order, so I have to flash back to this and that and stuff. And you're just watching. It's like I saw this movie three years ago <laughs> when it starred Ryan Reynolds for Christ's sake. What the hell is going on? But that is the grand tradition of Marvel and DC. It's just like, yeah. oh, that was a good idea. Yoink. I'd argue that. Harley Quinn is not even the best choice to be a Deadpool analog. I'd suggest Joker Ooh. might be better. Mm, that is true. Oh, that'd yeah. be interesting. There yeah. have been adaptations where Joker knows he's in a comic. Mm. I, I don't think Harley Quinn's ever known she was in a comic. 
I, don't th- I think, though, because the Joker has so much, like, genuine murderous intent, yeah, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where he's, like, a genuinely evil guy, whereas Harley can mm-hmm. kind of get away with, like, oh, she's done some bad stuff, but she's kind of ditzy yeah. and lovable and stuff. You where... can say, oh, she's in a good girl mood today. Yeah. She's, yeah. She feel, she's feeling anti-hero. Mm. I was going to say she's more fun, but, I mean, I find yeah. the Joker the most fun there is. Yeah. <laughs> and to be fair to Birds of Prey, too, like, they don't, like, they do have her do some pretty nasty things in it, where you're like, sure. oh, yeah, she is kind of a dick in this, too. So, I yeah. guess that's nice that they're not trying to go, like, oh, she's completely the good guy this time. It's like, no, she's still, she's still a bad person, but she's learning and whatnot. <laughs> but, um, but that, that's the thing, though, with this, with this minute, like, once you're analyzing it minute by minute, like, you can, obviously, within the context of the movie, you watch this, and you're like, oh, this was a trap they're setting up for Batman the whole time. But looking at it, you know, on a microscopic level, it is so obvious that they're setting up Batman here. It's continue mm-hmm. on from the, the previous minute, where, like, Two-Face is like, okay, time for phase two. And then he was, he was like, I am Batman, going like, here I am, I'm in the elevator. Look at me get in the elevator. Here I am, uh-huh. And now he's going down. He's shooting that gun in the air to be like, in case he loses track of where we are, I'm yeah, firing yeah. this gun so he can track us. And then the way they go over to the scaffolding, and begin, it's so rehearsed. It's like, we know exactly where we're going. We know mm-hmm. exactly what we're doing. And now it kind of makes like, the thing is, in modern day comics, like, they get in that tunnel and Batman would already be there. Like, that's how like overly almost supernaturally friggin mm-hmm. gifted batman is as he's so far ahead of the game and i'm not a big fan of that because like well he has to be fallible in some respects and stuff but like this minute here kind of makes batman out to be a bit of a chump quite frankly because yeah well i think he's maybe getting a bit too like he, he wants to stop this right now his sense of justice is taken out it's too much he's not thinking straight He's like, right, I can get him, I can get him, I can do it. But the thing is, he should be thinking more, because, like, the beginning of the movie, Batman was tearing after Two-Face, and he's like, oh, look at this guard in this vault that's been left open for me. (laughs) Well, look what happened there! Like, that was a trap. Shouldn't he, like, if this was an Arkham game, and I was up on top of a building chasing Two-Face, and I looked down, and I saw him blowing a kiss at me, and jumping (laughs) in a hole, I'd be instantly like, Detective Vision? Something's in that hole. I'm not gonna just jump down straight after him. Because clearly, this is a setup. Yeah. No, it's true. I'm Team Nile with this. I think he does come off looking a bit like a chump. It doesn't take the world's greatest detective to tell that this is some <laughs> kind of trap. Hey, you but know, in the heat of pursuit, in, things happen. <laughs> so in Batman's defense here, one, it is then consistent with what we saw at the beginning of the movie. Mm-hmm. Two, even this minute in real time is probably a couple seconds so he has a couple seconds to react to uh you know uh two face coming down shooting jumping in the hole so on and so forth so it's not like he's got a full minute to analyze it and so on and so forth and again like i said this is consistent with what we saw at the beginning you know obviously we're sort of when we see batman we're thinking of every adaptation of batman where he's the super detective genius who who knew this was a trap before he even popped in the roof of the other building Mm. this Batman isn't necessarily that super analytical genius in that way. Mm. No, you barely see him doing anything of the sort, to be honest. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) But it's just more, like, it really, the fact that he hasn't learned from his mistakes, though, because he's like, oh, Two-Face got me once already. But, like, you think this would would be a situation like, okay, I'll jump down. I won't jump straight into the hole because, you know, beyond the fact that they've, like, they didn't even have this big freaking tube thing to get him in. Batman could have just gone in that hole and then just broken his legs. Could have landed on something instantly because he's got no way to slow himself down with the cape when he lands there. It should yeah, have been more cool. Well, oh, oh, the, thi- oh, the thing is, get that shot in a minute. That shot for 1995 CGI looks fantastic. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But it's just the fact, like, if, again, if this were me and I were Batman, like, playing as Batman in one of these Arkham games, I'd be like, I'm not going to go sh- jump straight into it. I'm going to, like, grapple myself down and then maybe like peer over the edge to see what could be waiting in there for me or something. And then, you know, with that game of like, if you put on the detective vision and you can't see anything in the hole, it's like, okay, it's clearly a cut scene where something horrible is going to happen to me <laughs> once I go in there. Yeah, but when you're playing that, do you never get the urge to just go for it? Because I do. I just, I just I'm, jump right down the hole. I'm and like, like ah. the most cautious video game player. Like, if there's... I'm never tripped up by, oh, there was an NPC I didn't get a chance to talk to. 
Mm, I've yeah. talked to every NPC to make sure, oh, I didn't miss the information here. Mm. So even if I saw the cutscene where he dropped down the hole, I probably went to the hole very slowly. <laughs> I, I found the police character NPC next to the hole who says, Two-Face and his gang went down the hole. Go, <laughs> go after him, Batman. <laughs> <laughs> and then you spoke to him again to make sure there's no more dialogue. Yeah. You'd be throwing batarangs in there to see if you hit something. You'll throw yeah. the, the remote control a... batarang in there so you can see if it goes yeah. into the tunnel so you can do exactly. a little... Do I have a bat bomb I can drop? Yeah. Is there yeah. another way into the hole? <laughs> but no, nah, this this version of Batman is just like... You know, the fact that it, he's looking down and two faces like standing there going like, look, look at the hole, and then blowing him a little kiss, like doing a friggin'... You're half expecting them to turn around and go like, I'm telling you, I didn't kill my wife. And then Batman would be like, I don't care. And so freaking, they could have done the reference is what I'm saying if they wanted to. Hell yeah. <laughs> I love that little kiss. That's dead funny. It's, as it's... tall as that building is, does he even see that gesture? Uh, he Batman's can't, at the right. top of the building. There's no way. You can't. When you see it from near the top, because when he jumps, then the camera moves so you can see the ground. You you can't see any of the people. Mm. You can't even really see the hole. Yeah. Two-Face having to get out of like, his pink flares and just like, here I am. Come in. The- Look, I'm throwing him in the hole. That's where you want to go, Batman. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this Batman doesn't have, you know, the technology for like, you know, he can't zoom in. He hasn't got like yeah. goggles on or anything. It's just his normal eyes. Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. that is true. Now, this is, you know, sans detective vision. Now, I think that was a creation of like post-2000 comics. Right? So... This is ba- ma- born back in... Again, though, to be fair, they are hearkening more back to your 60s kind of Batman. And mm-hmm. that was a guy who got caught in traps every goddamn week. Like yeah. <laughs> He never figured it out. It makes sense. It fits that vibe they're going for, that he'll get, he'll yeah. get trapped by the villain and have to figure his way out of it once again. Mm. And in keeping with the 60s Batman, there's kind of... The stakes are kind of lower. So you mentioned, what if he drops in the hole and breaks his leg? This Batman mm-hmm. doesn't get hurt. Mm. No, I don't think 60s Batman ever really got injured. No, no. no. You know, He's... obviously that's something we saw all over the Christian Bale Batman was look at all the bruises and scars on your back and your knees have no cartilage and so on. But <laughs> this Batman, this Batman's physically fit. Like a scenes of like Alan Napier sewing up like a bleeding wound on his shoulder <laughs> or something. Like, what well, be more well, well, careful next time, Master Bruce. Robin, oh. I have torn my ACL. <laughs> I want a really realistic follow up to this. We we need a proper sequel where we get we have Val and everything and it's just dead like dealing with the injuries he sustained. Nice. <laughs> well, we get a little uh, a little 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 bit of that towards the end of this week, don't we? So I mean, the little injuries bit. are just minor. It's the most you see him wounded, mm-hmm. I would say, yeah. when we get yeah. to that point. That's the thing, though. Like, looking, Batman now peering down onto the street view. Uh, he's got his Google Street View up. And there is a sign that, it, to be fair, like, you could look at it at a simple, simplistic level of, like, the sign is a man pointing downwards with both hands towards the hole where Batman's supposed to go. <laughs> as if Two Face again planned that. Like, he commissioned the building of this neon sign to be like, well, make sure he sees that sign so he knows where this thing's pointing. So he's like, hey, that's where you want to go. But I'm, I've also been trying to figure out, like, what the hell this sign is actually for. Because it, in, like, I think I said in the green room, like, it reminded me a little bit of the, the Bolton sigil in Game of Thrones with the flayed man. Yeah, yeah. And also because it seems like it's got, like, little, like, he's on top of a keyboard. It almost looks as if someone's done a stick man rendition of the classic scene from Big of the guys jumping, like, Tom oh. Hanks and uh, Robert Loggia jumping on the keyboard and stuff. That's what it is. <laughs> They like just Joel, wanted to profess their love of Big. And this Joel Schumacher is like, I never get to tell people how much I love Big. But I'll, I'll do it via this subtle reference within this I, one shot of Batman Forever. I actually tried like looking up what this was. I tried multiple avenues and got nothing. Mm. Uh, just a very brief sidebar. Uh, listeners of ID4 Minute will be very proud of me. You mentioned Robert Loja, and I did not do my Robert Loja impression. Robert oh. Loja. <laughs> well, well, now you're going to make me do it. <laughs> now you have to. Robert Loja. Yes. <laughs> Citizens of Fair Gotham. It is I, Robert Loja. Robert uh, Loja is one of those actors. Like, I'm convinced he came out of the womb with that head. 
and just chomping a cigar already. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. put me to work. <laughs> hey, Ma. He came out of the womb with whiskey cigarette voice. <laughs> But the, but then the, the, we did mention like Batman does this uh, this jump down like a bit of a foolhardy jump quite frankly but mm-hmm. he it's does, crazy but uh, as we mentioned earlier like for for 1995 this is an entirely CGI shot this is really good like yeah. this is this is how CGI should be it's like because it's quite dark so I guess you're not gonna notice the mistakes and whatnot it's quite fast. But it's really, like, it's probably the most dynamic shot we've had in any Batman movie, really. Like, we've seen him jump down off things before, mm-hmm. but it's always been very slow when he's had the, the the cape expanded out and stuff, and it's been cool. But it's not been like, holy crap, this is like a comic book, watching the guy jump straight down into a thing, and you're seeing the, the building zoom past him as he goes down, and, like, he does a little cape flap to sort of slow the descent, I guess. And it's uh, it's really, really well done. So fair play to them for for pulling off this yeah. shot. Yeah, I was very surprised how like good it looked. Most things from that era look absolutely awful. Mm. They're, they're barely watchable. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but this, yeah, it, it holds up so mm. very, very well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Although, um, as much of a technological showcase as it is of the nineties, um, like. When I do this on video games again, if I jump off something really big on a Batman game or Assassin's Creed or something, I I genuinely feel sick mm. <laughs> like, and have to stop. <laughs> Once it hits a certain point and the character's still falling, it really affects me as if it's actually happening. It's horrible. Mm. So I wonder if he's uh, he's feeling it or is you he get, used to it by now? Eh? You're just getting too in the like, Will Graham-esque... Sort of, I just I join in with the em- empathy with the the character mm. too much now. I feel his pain. I've I become do. one yeah. with the uh, you know Lara Croft Tomb Raider or something. <laughs> and actually, I really love as well the way the camera is really dynamic. The camera sort of moves around, mm. but and it gives a few crazy angles that you you couldn't do back yeah. then unless you had CGI. Because I thought it made me feel the viewer like I am kind of flapping around like his cape in the yeah. wind. I think this was a real money shot too, so I do remember like a lot of the promos would have been like, "Check out this oh, shot!" Yeah. Like this, look, look how much money we spent on this. Doesn't it look great? <laughs> yeah. And- in an alternate universe, I would love to see like this shot in the Christopher Nolan Batman because you know he's obsessive about doing things in practical. Yeah. Mm. I would love to see him them find a way to do this one practically, like basically drop an action figure off of a model set. <laughs> <laughs> or something that'd be great he's, he's a guy who was just like well the script calls for flipping over an 18 wheeler truck <laughs> All right. flip over an 18 wheeler <laughs> yeah good. I guess we, we said we're gonna do it we can't just write that out so I guess we gotta do it <laughs> although speaking of things actually that have been written out um this sequence in the original draft is a uh, this comes at the end of a much longer chase uh, it actually has an entire sequence where uh, Two Face and his gang of cronies uh, launch onto a subway train, uh, and they go speeding off, uh, you know, just amongst the people of Gotham, just kind of standing there on the train, just like a bunch of chumps, much like Batman himself. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Batman then, in uh, you know, dogged pursuit, runs into the subway train after them, uh, well, not into the train, into the station, jumps on the back. Uh, and apparently it's just a very perilous thing where he's dangling just above the third rail. So it's as if, you know, a bat- Batman could die at any goddamn second. He's hurtling on a train. He's right above the third rail. And just ignore the fact he's covered in rubber, which would probably, you know, <laughs> make him perfectly all right if he did touch the rail. Because um, he couldn't electrocute him through the rubber. Uh, it's <laughs> like, it's, you know, he's going to die and stuff. And then eventually the train stops. Two-Face and his men run out. And uh, then they go into an abandoned tunnel, and that's where they find you know this the whole thing that's going to come at the end of this minute. No. But, uh, I thought that was kind of weird because that's a consistent thing that they always take out of the Batman scripts that have that we've found so far. Is like, oh yeah, in the first movie they had a whole bit at the end where the street was supposed to collapse onto it on top a subway train, and they're yep. like, yeah. So you can imagine the producer going like, nope, that's going to cost way too much money. What the hell's the point of even doing that? And again, here, it's just like, so Batman, he's attached to the back of a train for a bit, and then the train stops, and they get out. Like, what's, no. like the, Just get rid of the train. Because, <laughs> again, too, like, you can't even do it, like, I guess another film from 95 that had a, a big scene with a 
blowing up, ac- actively blowing up a subway train was Die Hard with a Vengeance. But that's okay, because that's like, oh, that's realistic New York. You can just have John McClane run around. You can go film in actual subway tunnels and stuff. I think that was also the big set. That was like the big set piece of that movie, though, too. That's where a lot of the budget wound up going, I think, was blowing mm. up the subway. Yeah, but with this as well, you'd have to be like, nah, this is a, the, the subway, you couldn't just go in and film a normal subway. You'd have to design a new train. You'd have to make, you'd have to like liquid sky it up and make it like, oh, what kind of crazy cockamamie neon drenched <laughs> super train would Gotham have? Like, and then what would the tunnels be like and stuff? And you can imagine like, you know, it'd be a lot easier if we just took the money from that and did a really cool CGI shot of him jumping down into a hole. I was like, wouldn't that make Batman look like an idiot? I'm like, no, well... If it's go, if as long as you're not watching it minute by minute, you won't care. You'll be perfectly fine. And then, little did they know that a mere twenty five years later, somebody would have a beef with it. But... <laughs> they should have foreseen. <laughs> um, also, it, bringing up Die Hard ties into something I always uh, find fascinating. Right? Why do so many movies have a sort of showdown with a villain on a sort of construction site? Mm. Like that's a, oh, that's a recurring theme. Die Hard does it multiple times. This does it. It, it, it's, it endlessly happens in films. It's always a half-built I, building I or it, subway. I think it's because it's a naturally dangerous environment. Like it's good yes. random holes everywhere. You got random tools. You got bits of metal jutting up all over the place. <laughs> you can kind of design it any way you want. You're just like, okay, yeah. so this needs to be here. That needs to be there. Whereas if you had like an actual location, it'll be like, well, that wouldn't make sense. But on a building site. It's totally fine to have a random bit of yeah. metal just hanging from the roof that you're going to swing into somebody or, or something like that. Yeah, and I any kind it. of unfinished state is just going to look natural because you just accept, oh, it's a construction site, so that's why there's only <laughs> half a wall there. That's what it is. It's, it's a cut corners. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, you don't have to decorate a wall when all your wall is just a sheet of drywall. <laughs> And also, it makes sense, I suppose, not so much in this case, but in other movies where the villain's lair is in a construction site, because it's an easy place to sort of take over. You know, nobody's going to be looking for the villain in a half-built building. Yeah, that's true. Especially (laughs) in a city where potentially there's corruption and stuff like that. It's certainly very possible to imagine a villain continually greasing the right palms to make sure yeah let's just leave that building under construction mm. yeah because it's like a it's a mask or even disc- if if things are slightly more ethical you just have construction jobs that just kind of pause because blah 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 with the union or whatever yeah or if so, it's liverpool yeah. the company turns out to be fraudsters <laughs> multiple, <laughs> multiple times <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if there was just something like, oh, Rupert Thorne, he's, he's got the money coming in from criminals, from supervillains, to keep construction projects going throughout Gotham. So they'll have places to hang out. <laughs> so so like, you're suggesting <laughs> supervillains, in fact, pay rent? Well, I guess that <laughs> technically would be the thing. Just like, oh, man, I better rob a bank. Old man Thorne's breathing down my neck here for this goddamn <laughs> rent. Do, does Harvey still uh, turn in his taxes? <laughs> That's what I want to know. Does he have to turn in two taxes because he's obviously oh, got two, two oh. identities? <laughs> no, they filed jointly. Oh, but, oh. The, but the thing then is just like, are you in a relationship? Is like, well, I'm kind of in two. <laughs> I'm in a poly, uh, yeah, polyamorous relationship. So what 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 do I fill out in the form? Like, just put other, okay? <laughs> and like, right in box below. And he's like, all right. So I gotta get my red pen and my blue pen. And fill out both sides of my personality in this goddamn form. <laughs> Speaking of businesses catering to supervillains, I guess, this occurred to me while I was rewatching it. Does Harvey only have one version of his suit and thus is never washing it? Or does he have a few and he's a few identical versions and he's got to send them out periodically to supervillain dry cleaning? Well, that's the thing. From actually watching the movie, he does have quite a he, – he, he spins his wardrobe quite a bit, actually, because what he's wearing here is a new variation. Like, he's got um, – yeah. like, this is his tuxedo. And like in the scene where he first meets the Riddler, like, he's not wearing the zebra stripes. He's wearing, like, this kind of cowboyish-looking jacket, and he's got, like, a black and white dot, you know, shirt and stuff. And mm. you see him a couple of times. I'm like, oh, no, he's actually got, like, multiple outfits. Like, obviously, in the circus, he had a different outfit and stuff. So I guess, like, he – yeah, maybe he, like – Maybe sugar or spice. 
I was, yeah, was going to say sugar and spice. I would think they're his seamstresses then, because I can't imagine him having the patience to sit there and <laughs> actually make this costume piece himself. Oh, 100%. No. Yeah, definitely. And I'm mostly worried about what he does with the other half, because he's sewn two halves together, but he can't sew the other two halves together, because then the patterns don't match the personality. So is he just chucking them in the bin? <laughs> Is he just disposing of all of these items he, of clothing? He saves them for Halloween, so then when he dresses up, Two Face uh, will have the he Harvey Dent clothes. I on. would imagine that Sugar or Spice or both, whichever one of them is the seamstress in this relationship, um, they probably have like a whole room full of fabric swatches and things like that <laughs> to, um, you know, like, well, I can save the left half of the good suit to, uh, you know, kind of put little patches onto the left half of a bad suit later ah, to sort of, yeah. you know, sort of kind of two faceify it. I like that. Recycling. Yeah. And I'd say as well, if I was to hazard a guess, I would say it's Sugar that's the seamstress because mm. you'd notice throughout the movie, she, well, particularly in the last scene, she seems to be closer to the Riddler. And then he shows up in this like sequined outfit later. Like we well, he gets that friggin' neon thing later on. And... He, get, he shows up in his silver onesie towards the end. So if he was in tight with her, I can imagine him like, oh, you wouldn't mind making me a couple of these uh, swanky outfits that you got Two-Face going with? And she's like, oh, of course, by all means. So Because uh, yeah. I don't think we ever see him spend any amount of time with Spice. But he, if he, maybe he's uh, – that's why he's in tight with Sugar because he's just trying to win over her favor, get himself <laughs> a, a couple of free outfits have, out of this have arrangement. Have you guys <laughs> determined if Sugar and Spice, are they paid employees? Are they <laughs> – I think they are 100% just there for the fetish. I think they are mm, yep. really just like they are fetishist lifestyle people. Like they are – there could be that, you know, every once in a while they go home, they have normal – you know, maybe not normal families, but they have normal lives. And then once the sun goes down, they get on the outfits and then they're part of Two-Face's, you know, harem uh, oh, again. And that's if why I paid, think yeah. – that's why I think that it can't just be – Sugar, who's the seamstress, I think it has to be a collaboration because yeah. both mm-hmm. Sugar and Spice only ever represent their side yeah. of Two Face. So mm, Sugar yeah. would never make a perfectly balanced suit. She's always the one that's like, oh, let, like, let's make everything sweet and let's make everything nice. And then you have to have Spice coming in like, oh, no, let's make it nasty and like, yeah. let's mm. make it evil. Mm-hmm. And so well, it, it, could, it could be, though, that maybe in Sugar's day to day life, she is like normally a seamstress and she's been paid by Two-Face. Uh-huh. When she's out in the like she's just like a normal bohemian kind of artsy kind of you know lady, and then she's like, "Oh, he's paid me to make this crazy suit for him." Okay, and then again, as soon as the sun goes down, she's like curling the hair, and then she turns into like a sort of almost like um, what do you call it the uh, like a kind of you know the like a kinky version of uh, the domesticized woman who's there to mm. make dinner and she likes all things nice and what do you call that that lady who like in the nineteen fifties used to have a kinda like a TV show um that was just like about her running the family and stuff. Like a really wholesome kind of uh, I know what you mean, but I can't think I remember they the, had a whole episode about the Gilmore girls all about her as well. <laughs> like they had a recurring joke about it. But uh, That's gonna annoy me all day. June and Cleaver? Yeah. I'm not too sure. Are they Leave like, it so- Cleaver? Well, that 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 kind I of mean. mother figure, though, like you know, mm. the 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 nineteen fifties domestic housewife, and then mm. so Sugar's doing like a kind of exaggerated kinky version of that, where she's like, mm. oh, she's you know, everything's nice and stuff, but like I make the dinner for him when he comes home, and all it's... everything's nice and sweet and stuff, and then for all we know, like Spice is out there, she's like a bank clerk or something, maybe. <laughs> yes, totally foreign <laughs> lady, and then when she, when she like all of a sudden. Sun goes down. She's strapping on the leather corset. She's getting the whip out, she, which is a thing that a lot of people actually are like in real life anyway. Oh, yeah. See, so, this is why I if... love this podcast, because that actually <laughs> makes me like both of those characters more. So I, I never I love Drew Barrymore, but I never quite bought Sugar because how how much of a goody two shoes could she possibly be if she's hanging out with a super villain? But if she's mm, just, yeah. if she's a little bit villainous herself, but is just play acting, like you said, mm. the exaggerated housewife character, well, that kind of makes it make sense. So, mm. 
And it's also like they have two personas, like Harvey himself. Uh, uh, <laughs> oh, maybe we do have the other little bit though, just the of the the, the tube. Because um, then, of course, yeah, Batman goes through the hole into a tube uh, that they have mm-hmm. waiting for him. Uh, again, they probably could have killed him much faster had they just not bothered with the tube. Just let him fall and friggin' crack his skull on the goddamn floor. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you but, underestimate that bat cape, <laughs> but the, the I don't know because the like I'm looking way too much into this though. But I remember one time seeing like a nature documentary where they talked about um, apparently it's a thing that snakes do is that they'll shed their skin and it leaves a long flesh tube kind of thing, a bit similar mm-hmm. to that. Yes, and then like they, they so the, you know <clears throat> hunters will come along and like oh I've got the drop on this snake. Turns out. No, the snake was around the corner. You've you've accidentally bitten the flesh tube, right? and now the snake's got you. The f- uh, you've bitten the flesh tube. Bitten the tube. flesh tube. <laughs> you've, you've pounced That's on the also... flesh tube. <laughs> <laughs> That's a brilliant tactic, though. I I do that. Yeah, again, I'm going to mention this. I do that in video games. Like, uh, if I'm playing like Call of Duty or something like that, I'll be getting attacked. So I'll I'll put like a C4 down or something, mm. and I'll. I'll I'll lure them around the corner. I'll like fire as if like, oh, I'm scared. I'm backing off and firing. But really, I've put a little trap there. <laughs> it's it's always baffles me though the fact that like that's a thing that it that it naturally knows to do because that's like you're but you're describing mm. there, John. It's like that's intelligent tactical thinking. Well, I won't go that far. <laughs> but, but I mean, the fact that the snake is just like oh, snakes yeah. not gonna you know it's not as intelligent as humans, but it's just like it just instinctively knows that like okay, I'm gonna shed this skin, I'm gonna leave it there, and then when this thing comes to attack me, I'm gonna actually get the drop on it, and then that's my prey. It's like that's crazy that it just naturally knows to yeah. do that. Isn't that wild? I that's one of the things I love the most about animals. Like how. Do they know that? Mm. Who, how have they taught that? Well, they're not. <laughs> well, they might be. Who knows? It's yeah. crazy. Yeah. <laughs> but um, also the tube also reminds me of, of uh, in um, you know, an alien because they have the, mm. obviously the little tiny chest burster, and then I think later on they have to establish that it's grown somewhat. So they have a bit where they find the random flesh. And it looks a little bit like that tube to me. It's just like, oh, what the hell is this thing? It's like, oh, it's the skin of the alien. It's growing. Oh, my God. What are we going to do? So this tube, though, this is one of those that builders use, right? When they are up high and they want to throw, like, debris. Mm. Yeah. It, yeah. Because yeah. I've seen these outside my house. And I... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, I whenever I see them, I always think... Oh, wouldn't it be fun to jump in that tube? And, <laughs> yes! and I, it must be because of this movie. I never realized it. <laughs> that makes sense. I've always thought that all my life. That I mean, might be what it is. I mean, like, afterwards, Batman sent Alfred, like, Alfred, go out and buy one of those tubes for me. Because I think I, I think I'd find a new fun way to enter the Batcave. <laughs> <It's just like, laughs> like, beyond the almost dying, I had a pretty good time in that tube. <laughs> it was fun. But at, but at the other end of the tube, they're waiting. They yeah. pump some kind of weird purple gas into the room. Mm. Joker gas. Nope. <laughs> but uh, we then get one of my favorite lines in the whole movie because it's so uh. stupid. But it's genuinely hilarious. I cracked up watching this <laughs> again. So, uh, Harvey just goes, nothing like a bad case of gas. See, that, that, that was what I was alluding to earlier, though. You love that line, John. I think that is the worst line of dialogue in any Batman movie. But that's ever. why it's so good, because it's so dumb. That's the way I just re- The thing is, though, because I'm not a big, like, flatulence joke guy. Like, it's just a, always a thing where I'm just like, all right, whatever, I get it. <laughs> but, like, it, it never it never rings my bell. But, like, if the Joker said this, okay, maybe. But now, like, as soon as Two-Face says that, I'm imagining... Old man Tommy Lee Jones farting. That's not an idea. That's not an image I want in my head. I don't want to think about Tommy Lee Jones doing that. The thing that bugs me about that line, I think, is just that there are better ways to do that joke. There are better jokes there. There are better gas jokes. Because a bad case of gas is not a good thing that you say nothing like it. I guess that's not a good thing that's happening to Batman, though. He's gonna go. He's about to have a bad time. So, like, there's nothing like a bad case of gas. Now you got me defending the joke, Alex. Are you happy? Are you happy with that? <laughs> well, that's the thing. If it depends how you're reading it, because I, I actually, yeah, I agree. It doesn't make any sense when you actually when you break it down. But you could argue, well, there's nothing. There's nothing like it. Oh, it's an experience. Oh, oh God. <laughs> 
But it, he is saying it in the way of like, it's a positive, you know. Oh, there's <laughs> nothing like a bad case of gas. Yeah. Well, it, like, that doesn't. I think it would be I, more consistent with just his zany portrayal of Two Face if he said something along the lines of "So long, bat dope. It's been a gas." Yeah, yeah. something yeah. like that. Yeah. But then I don't get the hilarious fart. <laughs> right. <laughs> Sorry. Or even if his portrayal of Two Face had included more. I'm going to say modulation, but uh, if we saw a little more of that quiet delivery, like, could you imagine he slides down this tube and then we get, you know, the quiet Harvey Dent line, nothing like a bad case of gas. Kaboom. Mm. Mm. I think it, it, I think it doesn't work for me just because every line is delivered at this kind of 10 frantic mm. kind of pace. <laughs> it's actually, it's odd you say that though, because in the novelization, and they do have two, the, both sides of the personality both have a little line. Because Two-Face says, uh, you know, nothing worse than a bad case of gas. Uh, and then Harvey Dent says, um, the bat has flown. Now shall be done a deed of dreadful note. <laughs> then he says, he, he pauses to consider and says, Macbeth, Shakespeare, never mind. Fire in the hole, gentlemen. And then, then he fires the thing. But I don't know. The, the only the, the thing with the, the the bad case of gas is just like that's like it really it's 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 lowering the tone to me. Quite frankly, <laughs> it's like I, that's that's what I just have like I never liked it. I never liked it when I was a kid. It was just, uh, plus uh, now it just reminds me because of what he's about to do. It's kind of like a big expanded thing version of a thing that Jim Carrey does in Dumb and Dumber. When he has that vision of trying to like impress Mary's friends and stuff at like the the, the cabin they're staying at, oh, yeah. and he starts lighting his farts. That's Jim Carrey did it in, in Dumb and Dumber out the same year, and now Tommy Lee Jones is having to one up him by doing it on an industrial scale where you've got an entire stream of gas pouring in that he's going to light an entire room on fire. <laughs> it's perfect. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what is perfect, actually. Batman's reaction mm. because he actually looks shocked and scared because yeah, Harvey fires the gun, ignites the gas. And I like seeing Batman worried. Yeah. It makes him less of a Superman, so to speak. Like he looks like, Oh crap. What am I going to do? And mm. you rarely see him in that position. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, it's a distinct difference between, uh, I think we talked about back in 89, like, at the at the end when he's completely beaten up and he's just after gonna have a plane crash mm. and he's got like the Joker, like the really tough Joker goon who's knocking the absolute crap out of him. Mm-hmm. Like I love that that version of that version of Batman is like no matter how much of a beating he takes, he keeps keeps getting straight back up and straight back into the fight because he's that pathological. Whereas yeah. this is more of a human version that I also like because I will actually talk about it in the next minute as well. It's like I do like, you know, Batman being fallible. Uh, as well as sometimes when he seems supernatural and whatnot, but yeah, I do enjoy the fact that like they've they've torn him down a peg. Like he looked like a chump earlier, but so I, I'll forgive mm-hmm. that because it gets him to a point where it's like, oh no, he is just a guy, and like they they get one up on him, and he is just like, oh crap, I might yeah. actually die now. <laughs> yeah, I also like so... that his movements are so fluid as Batman when mm. before the terrible bad gas line when he just lands from dropping through the tube and recovers from the landing and then flips his cape back dramatically it's it, it you see more of a like martial arts trained like two-fisted fighter batman i think that looks yeah. really cool mm. yeah that's a that's a good thing in this whole movie to be honest like obviously it's not as good as the last two but anything to do with Batman's fighting abilities is better in this film. Mm. He just... comes across like a fighter. Yeah, and that's really like mm. as a guy who's learned how to take a fall. Like mm. the, I think that's the thing they do in the military and stuff too. Like for paratroopers and whatnot, it's like oh, you have to learn how to land. Mm-hmm. So if you yeah. you know, or just at any soldier, I guess it's like oh, if you fall out of something, here's what you do so you're able to roll and get back up. And that's he, he has trained himself to do that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a good, that's a good shout. Yeah, I can tell you I trained martial arts for a bit when I was younger, and there was one class that was all breaking your fall. Oh, nice. Mm-hmm. 
I know it's a classic episode of uh, Only Fools and Horses. It was a great, great British sitcom. It was probably the most famous British sitcom of all time. But they have their da- like um, doddering old Uncle Albert, who's like an old man, uh, falls down like a, a chute where like you know people they, they collect beer barrels and stuff. And the whole episode's about him suing the pub and whatnot. Uh, and then at the end, like because he's supposed to be in the navy too, they keep they always mention that he's in the navy. That he was in the navy. He was a young man. And then, like in the final court proceeding, they're like, "Are you the same Albert Trotter who also fell down a hole in 1982 uh, and sued this pub, and the same Albert Trotter who in 1979 <laughs> fell down a hole and sued this pub?" And it turns out it's just like, it's a long con he's been doing for years of like because he trained in the navy, he learned how to take a fall properly, so he just pretends Jeez. to fall down like I'm just an old man who fell down, and it turns out like he's actually perfectly fine every single time and stuff. Ah. You know, it actually. I have gained a somewhat uh, newer appreciation from analyzing uh, of this scene because in my head, I'd always been thinking, why does he go all the way down the tube? Why doesn't he stop himself? Mm -hmm. But stopping himself, now he's going to put all of his weight on his shoulder joints and essentially rely on his arms and his shoulders to stop him from landing wherever, whereas here he can roll, he can tuck and roll. And mm. he can allow going down this tube, he can allow the friction to slow his descent. So, yeah. yay, I learned a thing. Yeah, or, actually, I gained yeah, an appreciation. It makes, it makes more sense than anything else, I'm guessing. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's a smart move, Batman. We've turned around. Yeah. <laughs> the guy still think you should have you just landed next to the hole and then looked in. It's like, that's just, yeah. you got a grappling hook. Just grapple yourself down and then just look <laughs> carefully. But anyway, <laughs> but yeah. so the whole place explodes. Batman is going to die. Yep. He's going As to die. Ends. He's going to going die. To die. <laughs> but I also do just want to say one final thing here. I adore the fact that 99% of this minute is just Two-Face making stupid noises, like you said before. <laughs> <laughs> just going, <laughs> Yeah, how... how... <laughs> Uh, voiceover is such a weird job that there was been an entire ADR session of just Tommy Lee Jones in the studio, like Tommy and go for six hours. But, um, but are we ready to wrap up this minute? So should we... <laughs> yes. Cause we've gone insanely we've, over. Time. We've gone an hour. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have anything else. <laughs> <laughs> of course, at the end of uh, Monday's episode, we always pose a riddle to the guests, and uh, this one's a bit of a doozy because uh, it's a little a little different from the ones we usually have. But uh, so I'll ask both of you fellas uh, to, well, obviously and John as well, uh, to riddle me this: A woman shoots her husband, then holds him underwater for five minutes. Next, she hangs him. Right after, they enjoy a lovely dinner. Can you explain this? Photograph. Oh, God damn it. Oh. That's it. That's actually it. Yes. <laughs> Holy crap. That was amazing. <laughs> That's up there. But like, I was, we were impressed the other week with Dale Kingsmill. That was on the same level of just knowing the friggin' answer straight off. Now you're, you're letting the side down here. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I, still, I never would have got that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That was amazing. So right. on that do wonderful, actually, wonderful. Do you actually hold a photograph underwater when you're developing it? Is that what it's developed under? I, well, I just legitimately don't know enough about developing I don't think it's water water, but there is like yeah. a developing fluid that you... Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. It's it, a it, water-based It's solution. accurate enough for the purposes of a riddle. Yeah. I think I would give yeah. it away if you just said, then yeah. she holds them under a developing solution. <laughs> <laughs> like, hmm, I have no idea. And he idea. became photograph man. <laughs> <laughs> hey, then again, these days, kids won't know what developing solution is yeah. or does or making photographs like... They just like yeah, photographs. Yeah, they're on your phone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. that's the thing you do with your phone. I've always thought kids must be really confused by the icon to save a document because it's a, it's a floppy disk. Mm. They'd be like, "What? What's that?" <laughs> <laughs> but before we go down that that road, we we will depart. We'll head off into the dark, dark night. Would our two wonderful guests like to tell people where they can be found online and whatnot? Let's start with I don't know. Let's pick at random. Ba 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 ba. Joff, you go first. You can follow me on Twitter at Inspector Flora and Instagram at Jarf Harden. And my podcast is Joe versus the Minute uh, with uh, 
friend of the show, Tierney, and we're covering Joe versus the Volcano one minute at a time, just like this, except we're talking about the Tom Hanks, Meg Ryan, 1990 fairy tale. And that's on Twitter and Instagram at Joe versus Minute. Hey, check it out, everybody. And uh, Alex? Uh, yeah, so my current project is Independence Day Minute. We are slowly winding our way towards the end of that one. Uh, you can check us out on Facebook at the Independence Day Minute Listener Squadron, on Twitter at ID4Minute, and uh, your podcatcher of choice. And check that out, everybody. I I mean, I've always loved Jeff Goldblum, right? But I've been watching, now that Disney Plus is in the UK, I've been watching that show he's doing on there for National Geographic, The <laughs> World According to Jeff Goldblum. And it's one of the most... Uh, like uplifting joyous things in this present <laughs> climate <laughs> Just, I, he's so happy i remember thinking before the podcast started that i was going to beat the gold boom impression to the ground the way that i beat the alan rickman impression to the ground on <laughs> galaxy <laughs> quest but after one week of doing it i realized even though it's funny and it's not a terrible impression i, I can't do it anymore because i stopped working on it it grinds everything to a halt <laughs> <laughs> it's like you're having, you're, going, your, um, you're having uh. your normal conversation and then we stop for two minutes for me to talk about the letter Q. <laughs> Imagine what it's like oh. to act with the actual Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> Hold well, on for That's what life. I discovered in this show is all these characters he's played that I love. It's not a character. It's just Jeff. <laughs> it's just him. He, he's not acting. In Independence Day, he's just playing himself. That's he's a- <laughs> it's like an episode of Friends where he's directing Joey. Like I just, I really hope like it's like yeah, that's what it'd be like to be directed by Jeff Goldblum, where he's just coming out with weird stuff and he's going on little side tangents and just like you're what, what you're doing is very uh, uh, horizontal. Don't be afraid to explore uh, uh, the vertical. And you're just like, what, what does that mean? What the f- are you talking about? <sighs> So and yeah, if anyone tangents. if anyone wants to hear that Jeff Goldblum impression, go back and listen to the episodes <laughs> at the beginning of the movie with Jim O'Kane, which was the only time I did it. <laughs> <laughs> Do that, everybody, and come and speak to us on Facebook, the Bat Minute Listener's Cave. And I don't know, what am I going to go with? Go to Patreon. Give us some money. I mean, that's always a good thing. And you get bonus content. You get wonderful, wonderful episodes talking about nonsense. So uh, do that, and we will see you all again on Wednesday for more Bat Minute Forever. Next time, burn, baddie, burn, dismal inferno. It's a a case of duck and cover for our caped crusader as uh, uh, the bat braces to be broiled uh, al dente. Very, very, very very good, very good. Uh, But as a crooked celebration is uh, ruined... uh, by a, a wraith's resurrection, uh, can cataclysmic construction destruction uh, rid Two Face of his bat-based obstruction? Oh, well, curious. Yes. Uh, find out on uh, Wednesday. Uh, same bat pod, uh, different bat minute. Ba da da ba da 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 da. Ba-da-da.